So, Danny Bressel, our speaker for today. Danny uh, is a friend of the group. I, I think you, you attended your first event maybe two summers ago, I think, something like that. Okay, Danny. Yeah, let's get started. that was awesome. Anyway, Danny, Danny's been coming for a while. Danny uh, has been involved in effective altruism, especially global catastrophic risks. I had an interest in it for several years. Probably was involved in effective altruism in some sense before I was. Um, he is now a PhD student at Columbia, uh, which is in sustainable development. Yes, PhD in sustainable development program. And and was also is it is it true? I claim this in the event. Is it true that you were a core, you were or are a core organizer of the uh, Columbia Effective Altruism? Yeah, that's yes. correct. Yeah. And of course, uh, Danny has now was it one summer or two summers that you did at the, uh, the four four. Oh summers? yeah. So four the five. Global Priorities Institute in Oxford. I spent last summer there, and then I was at a, a few conferences there this summer. So I'm not spending the whole summer, but it's a group I'm quite uh, uh, involved with. And what's the what's the Will McCaskill plan there again? So Will McCaskill is a research associate uh, with the uh, Global Priorities Institute. Um, so he does research with uh, the group. And uh, yeah, I, I was hanging out with him the whole weekend uh, two weeks ago. So nice. It's okay. good fun. He's a really nice guy. Absolutely. We have him, we have him to one of our events once. We'll do it again someday. Yeah, and he helped to found the movement for people that yes. don't know. Yes. Uh, yes, so you're sort of an OG. <laughs> and then. Um, <laughs> Yes, and I wanted to mention that you also have a background in, in uh, management consulting. So you have done yeah, sort of hands-on business, real-world impact assessments. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've worked in management consulting more or less for five years. I worked for a, a company for two and a half years, and I worked with a professor at Harvard Business School, did some academic work, and also some consulting work with him for two and a half years. So, yeah. Okay, so with that, I'll leave it off to Danny. Just keep in mind that we're going to have this talk and some Q&A, but there will be plenty of time at the end to hang around and eat and drink and discuss, uh, so don't, don't rush out the door. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I have a lot to get through. If I do this well, I think I can do it in about 35 minutes, uh, so you can time me if you want. I'm certainly timing myself. Um, feel free to ask questions during the presentation, um, but if you have like a really substantive point or something that's going to require some discussion, maybe save it for the end. We're going to have a ton of time uh, to talk uh, at the end, and there's a lot of stuff to get through, but definitely feel free to ask questions, especially if things aren't completely clear. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the impact of climate deaths on the social uh, welfare cost of climate change. Um, and I'm going to be using a, a sort of methodology which is called integrated assessment model. And you'll hear all about this over the course of the next 35 minutes. Okay, so let's motivate this a little bit. So John Broom is one of the leading uh, philosophers who thinks about climate change. Uh, and he has a, a great quote in this book that I would actually highly recommend reading. Um, he says that climate and population are intimately linked. If we are to evaluate climate change adequately, and assess policies that respond to climate change, we shall have to take account of changes in the world's population. Okay, so this research project, this is something that I've been working on maybe for about six months. Uh, this has become my master's thesis. Uh, I get a master's first along the way to getting a PhD at Columbia. Um, and I seek to answer a few questions. So the first one is how can we use the economic tool of integrated assessment modeling to assess phenomena that pose significant global mortality risk? Um, that's a, a sort of broad question. The second one is more specific. Under a business as usual uh, scenario, which is about 4.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial uh, uh, in terms of global average temperatures by 2100, how will global warming affect human mortality and the level of human population? And then finally, uh, what are the social welfare consequences of this? So hopefully I'll help to answer these questions over the next um, 35 minutes, 33 minutes. Um, okay, so not to bury the lead, I'll just uh, show you some of the key findings right at the beginning. We'll spend the rest of the time talking uh, about how we got here. Um, so what I project is that over the next 80 years, there's, uh, in this business as usual scenario, likely to be 76 million cumulative excess deaths due to climate change. Um, these are through three different channels, which we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about. One is the effect that climate change is going to have on health. Uh, the second one is the effect that climate change is going to have on interpersonal conflict that, that's deadly, essentially murders. And the third one is uh, the effect that it's going to have on intergroup conflict. 
The frequency of conflict between groups can include uh, civil wars, uh, 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 warfare, um, different levels of intergroup conflict. Okay, so the second uh, finding is that when we specifically account for these mortality costs, it triples the social welfare cost of climate change. Uh, so I'm building on this model we're going to talk about in a second, which is called the DICE model. Um, and um, uh, when I account for mortality, specifically in this model, it triples the social welfare cost. Uh, so we'll talk about what this all means and, and how, how I got here over the course of the presentation. So let me take a huge step back from the findings. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, I work with this institute called the Global Priorities Institute, and it brings together primarily economists and philosophers. Um, I come in on the economic side, so uh, my program is essentially a PhD in economics. We have uh, essentially the same training as PhD in economics with natural sciences on top of it. Um, so, if I had to pick a discipline in which I sit, it, it's uh, economics. Uh, but there's also a lot of philosophers. Uh, uh, that are interested in these types of issues and uh, that I work with and spend a lot of time with. Um, so what I've noticed is that uh, economists are focused on changes in GDP and consumption, but they don't think as much about changes in population. Uh, they have uh, made tools that are uh, practical and relevant for policy making, um, uh, and these are things that economists do. Uh, philosophers, on the other hand, uh, they're very focused on changes in population. There's a whole uh, field, a sort of subfield, uh, within ethics, which is called population ethics. And these two guys, that's uh, Derek Parfit and Nate Bostrom, they're uh, key philosophers uh, who are considered uh, uh, folks that work on population ethics. Uh, the other three guys up here are folks that are, are leading thinkers uh, in climate change economics. So that's Nick Stern, William Nordhaus, we'll talk a lot about him because I'm building on his model, and um, uh, Martin Weitzman. Uh, so, uh, that's taking a big step back. So what is integrated assessment? I've been talking about this integrated assessment thing. Um, so integrated assessment models, or IAMs for short, summarize information from a range of disciplines to assess complex phenomena uh, that have coupled effects on human and natural systems. Um, they're also tools to help decision makers understand complicated problems and to make optimal decisions. Um, so integrated assessment is a tool that has been used quite extensively in climate change. So uh, Bill Nordhaus, who's uh, on the previous slide, he actually won the Nobel Prize in economics this past year, primarily for his work on integrated assessment modeling related to climate change. Uh, so climate integrated assessment models integrate climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis, uh, and then they determine a social welfare cost of emitting carbon. Uh, so he pioneered integrated assessment with the DICE model, uh, uh, which stands for Dynamic Integrated Climate Economy Model. And this was first uh, developed in 1992. And he works, he, every few years he has an update. The re most recent update was in 2016. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I extend that model. I call it DICE EMR. And EMR stands for, this is uh, maybe a bit jargony, but it stands for Endogenous Mortality Response. So I take his model and I put it on an Endogenous Mortality Response. So what does that mean? Don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so let's, let's start with the DICE model itself. Um, so this model sort of builds off the what is called the neoclassical model, macroeconomic model, that seeks to uh, describe the long-term uh, uh, sort of development of uh, economies. So the way it starts uh, is you think about GDP, which is just the price of the the, uh, the value of all the goods and services produced within some area over uh, uh, some period of time, uh, that's GDP, some fraction of that is consumed, um, and then uh, con consumption is what people actually use of the GDP, uh, and that leads to average welfare, uh, and then there's the social welfare function, which is average welfare multiplied by population, multiplied by welfare discount rate, and then this is uh, added across time uh, and then this is optimized. Uh, so GDP directly feeds into uh, welfare through the amount uh, uh, that is consumed. And I'll, I'll go into some more detail on this in the next slide, actually. But then also, population provides a labor force, which is an input to GDP. So this might be more math than you were expecting, but uh, sorry. Um, but let's, let me be a little more specific about what this all means. So we're just looking at these bottom two 
uh, uh, circles here. So this essentially, at a super, super high level, describes what's called the neoclassical growth model. Um, so this is GDP. This is the equation for GDP. It's capital, labor, and then this other thing, which is called total factor productivity. And these three parameters determine the total amount of output. And then there's some fraction that's invested. And sort of the decision is, how much do you choose to consume? Because if you consume, then you have a higher average welfare in uh, the present time period. But the more you consume, the less you invest for the future. So if you invest more for the future, you can expect to have higher uh, GDP. Uh, but if you uh, consume more today, uh, then you can expect to have higher average welfare today. So traditionally, in macroeconomics, this is kind of the core, uh, the core question. And uh, uh, Charlene Koopmans won the Nobel Prize in 1965 for essentially making this model. This bottom model is called the neoclassical growth model. So Bill Nordhaus uh, used this model, and then he thought about, hey, climate has an effect on the economy. How can I model this? Uh, so what he did is he took this model, this neoclassical growth model, and he threw a climate model on top of it. Okay? So GDP, which is this figure right here, uh, uh, there's uh, some uh, sort of carbon intensity of the economy. So per unit of GDP, uh, there's some amount of emissions that are produced. Right? And as we hopefully all know, the more emissions there are, the more global average temperatures are going to rise. So that feeds into the climate model here. Okay? But what happens as temperatures get hotter, there's damages. This damages uh, uh, GDP. Uh, temperatures are getting hotter, certain uh, uh, sectors are getting disrupted, and there's damage to GDP. So it flows both ways. So there's emissions and then damage. Uh, and now what the uh, uh, choice you have to make is not just how much to save, you also need to think about how much should you emit, right? You, you, because if you abate emissions, uh, this can be costly if you try to do it really, really fast, right? Um, but um, uh, over time, uh, you're going to want to try to uh, uh, abate emissions such that you limit this damage. And how much you abate, uh, how much you uh, 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 save, these are all things that are optimized within this model. So to, sorry to be probably way more technical than you were expecting. But uh, this is sort of a very, very, in a nutshell, version of the thing that won the Nobel Prize this year. Um, so there you go. OK. But I think there's something missing with this model, if I can be so bold. Um, uh, the world population stays the same regardless of if there is 1 degree Celsius of warming, 2 degree Celsius of warming, or 10 degree Celsius of warming. So as John Brew mentioned at the beginning, uh, maybe we should actually think about uh, how warming is going to affect the world population, right? So uh, there was a, a very uh, publicized um, Lancet publication um, in 2009 that said that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So there probably will be population effects. So let's dive into this into some more detail. Um, so what this shows uh, on the left side here is under RCP 8.5, which is uh, a sort of warming scenario that projects that there's going to be 4.5 degrees Celsius as average temperature uh, increase uh, in 2100 uh, across the globe. Uh, this shows how the distribution of days in different temperature buckets, buckets change, changes. So the left-hand side, I, I presented to a lot of European audiences before, so this isn't Celsius, so I apologize. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, you can see that uh, there's a lot of days that are, are sort of mild, uh, in the low 20s, and there's very few days that are over 33 degrees Celsius. That's really hot. I think that's like over 90 or something like that. I, I don't know if there's any Europeans that can, maybe 91, 92, something like that. Um, anyway, uh, so there's very few days that are that hot. Um, but in the future, under this uh, RCP 8.5 scenario, there's going to be a lot of days that are that hot. Yeah, sorry, I was pointing this at my computer screen on here. Um, <laughs> you can't see that. Uh, anyway, so as you can see, there's a lot more days that, that are going to be quite hot. Um, so now let's look at a few different countries. So if you look at India, now fortunately these, if you can see it, it's a bit small. The, uh, these are now in Fahrenheit, right? So blue is, is, is what, it's, uh, what it's been in the latter half of the 20th century. So there's some days that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot. But there's not a lot. Most days are... In the low 80s, it's, it's uh, you know it's, it's pretty close to the equator, uh, and um, uh, there's not a ton of super hot days, even even so. But under this scenario, there's going to be a ton of really hot days in India uh, in 2100. Uh, now let's look at the United States. 
So the United States doesn't have a lot of days that are over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but under this scenario, uh, in 2100, there's going to be a lot of days that are that hot. So what does this all mean? Well, there's been a lot of um, uh, 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 work, particularly in econometrics and the public health field, that try to understand the effect of these changes in temperature on human health. So this is just really a partial list of some of the papers that have been written on this. I'm going to deep dive into uh, a few of these. Um, so this is a, a, a very important paper by Ali Deshen and Michael Greenstone, uh, which was published in 2011. And what they did was, again, uh, dividing, this was in the United States, dividing into different temperature bins. They tried to, uh, to understand the impact uh, of a day uh, in one of these bins compared to the 50 to 60 degree uh, Fahrenheit bin, which is sort of the optimized bin that minimizes mortality. So what does this mean? So above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, for every additional day that's in that bin, uh, the annual deaths per 100,000 increases by almost one per 100,000 uh, over the course of the year. Okay, so you're like, oh, maybe that's not that much. It doesn't look like much, but we'll see the effects of this when we actually throw it into the model in a second. Uh, so there's significant effects of uh, having um, uh, much of these really, really hot days. So you can see, oh, there's some smaller effects here, but once you get over 90, uh, the effects are, are quite large. And you can see also really cold days aren't great for uh, mortality as well, um, but in general, things are moving to the right. So we should be very concerned about this thing. Okay, so here's uh, a paper by Fu et al., which is in the, uh, more of a public health journal called PLOS Medicine. Um, and this looks at uh, sort of a similar analysis in India. Um, so in India, uh, again, we're looking at uh, different temperature bins and the effect that it has on mortality. It uses a slightly different metric, which is called odds ratio. It's commonly used uh, in public health literature. But uh, it's essentially, what is the effect of an exposure, exposure being these different temperature buckets, on mortality uh, compared to the, the minimum here at, at 30. Uh, so you can see that there's uh, significant, uh, it looks like over 1.5 uh, um, uh, uh, times increase uh, in mortality for these really hot days once you, once you get to 40 degrees Celsius. And you can also see that uh, it looks at uh, um, both uh, younger uh, ages, so people that are 30 to 69, so sort of middle aged, there's a, a, a very strong effect, and then there's a super strong effect uh, um, for age 70 and above. Wait, do you have a question? Does this only take into account uh, deaths from heat exhaustion and so on, or does it also take into account perhaps much higher numbers from insect borne diseases that will spread more widely? Yeah, so my, I, I would need to look at more carefully at this paper again, because I can't remember off the top of my head. I think what they do is the sort of what's called a reduced form econometric analysis. So they're not necessarily, say, they're not necessarily looking for specific mm. channels for, uh, through which this happens. They say that there's different changes in weather, and uh, depending on the, the day that the weather happens to be, there's some effect on mortality. So it's sort of agnostic. Uh, to the, the actual channel. And that's actually uh, consistent with a lot of this literature. It uses sort of reduced form econometric analysis. But I, I, I don't, I need to go back and look at this more carefully. Because I actually, I think that's what they do, especially given that this is the format of the analysis. But I need to look back, yeah, I need to look at this again to, to make sure that, uh, uh, that that's right. But I think that's what they do. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused. So, so this is, I was thinking naively, it was just the number of people who died on those particular hot days. It's more like this is that. odds ratio. So odds ratio is the effect of an exposure on mortality. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's probably so more technical. So, 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 so it includes the lay mortality as well. It, it what? It includes the lay mortality. Yeah, yeah so the people who die on hot days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's an issue. So there's uh, um, something which is I'm trying to, harvesting is the technical term, uh, which is when you have someone that would have died like in two weeks or in a month because they're um, they you know they're already sick, right? They would have died in two weeks or a month, uh, but because it's really hot, they happen to die on a hot day like two weeks or a month earlier, right? So what was kind of groundbreaking about this, the uh, the Shane and Greenstone paper, is that they had a, an econometric strategy to account for that. So they look at annual mortality as their dependent variable when they're running their regressions. So these little changes, uh, you know, the, the, the harvesting effect 
uh, uh, is mostly uh, dealt with in these. Uh, uh, and again, like I didn't do any of this work. I'm just telling you what uh, other folks have done, just to be clear. Uh, yeah. But those are uh, good, good questions. Mm. Uh, okay, so let's march on. Um, so there's uh, two other channels that the empirical literature has suggested uh, are likely to have uh, significant mortality effects. So one is interpersonal violence, and the other one is intergroup violence. So let's look at some of this. So fortunately, um, there was a very extensive meta-review that was undertaken by uh, Saul Shane, Marshall Burke, and Ted McGill in 2013 in the journal Science. Um, and what they did was that they looked at 60 studies across, uh, across different geographies, across different time spans, uh, around the world uh, uh, to look at the effect that changing temperatures have on the rate of conflict. So they looked at 30 studies, uh, I'm going off the top of my head here, I think 30 looked at intergroup conflict, 15 looked at uh, interpersonal conflict, and 15 looked at sort of the collapse of civilizations. Um, and what they found was that there was an overwhelming uh, uh, sort of positive uh, uh, relationship between an increase in temperatures and uh, increased rates of violence. Uh, so among the 27 studies that were carried out uh, from the 1950s to the present, which generally have the best data, 27 out of the 27 uh, found that increases in temperature uh, were associated with increases in the, in the rates of conflict. 27 out of 30? 27 out of 27, 100%. Oh. Uh, so this was a, a very important paper uh, that they, it took a lot of work. They, they looked at 60 studies that they thought that uh, the study didn't use quite rigorous enough econometric methods. They redid the study. Um, my understanding is that didn't make everybody happy. Um, but, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it, it was a pretty impressive analysis. So I, I leveraged that uh, meta review uh, in, in this work. Okay, so let's go back to the dice model, right? I'm just telling you what other people did. I didn't do any of that stuff. Um, if I did, maybe I, you know, I wouldn't be a, a, a doctoral student anymore. Um, but um, uh, let's go back to the dice model. So this is what I showed you before. There's a question, which is how much is mortality already included uh, within the current dice model? And the answer is that it's actually really hard to know, given the structure of the dice model, without, digging, without sort of digging several layers deep. Uh, into how this damage function, uh, which I circled here, is constructed. Uh, so uh, essentially what Nordhaus did uh, with a colleague, uh, this guy named Andrew Moffitt, who I think is now at the State Department, uh, in 2016, they did a meta review. Okay? And um, uh, in theory, uh, this damage function is supposed to include the direct effects on GDP, but also non-market damages. So if there are mortality impacts, that should be accounted for in this analysis. But it's sort of unclear, like, are all, the, are all the analyses including mortality impacts? Are the ones that do include mortality impacts, how much are they including mortality impacts? Uh, so it required that I actually look into these individual studies, uh, which, uh, which, which was fine. Um, but uh, anyway, so the, the way he constructed this was that there uh, were certain studies that were given a lot of weight. Some studies weren't given much weight, some studies were given a lot of weight. So I looked at the studies that were given the most weight and tried to understand how much uh, were health damages included in those studies? And what I found was that the answer is not very much. Some of the studies omitted health damages entirely. Uh, the one that, in, uh, of, the, of the, highly, um, the highly weighted studies, the one that uh, most included health damages said that uh, uh, out of the total damages, only 10% were due to health damages, which isn't really consistent with what uh, uh, the, the more recent empirical literature has been showing. Uh, so what I concluded is that um, in this current damage function, uh, the mortality costs are likely less than 5% of the climate damage. So the answer is it doesn't really account for these mortality damages very much uh, based on, on, on the, this review. Okay, so I said, let's, uh, let's think about uh, how uh, mortality is uh, likely to affect this model. So I added a new little uh, um, uh, system to this model, which is demographic. Right? So we've already established that average temperatures are likely to have a significant effect on the mortality rate. So what that's going to do, sorry, I'm going to go to the math slide if you guys don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just easier to, easier to, to, to do this. So the, uh, as temperatures get higher, um, there's a, a mortality response which affects the crude death rate. 
essentially the deaths uh, per population. Uh, so there's through those three channels we mentioned, there's going to be an effect on the crude death rate. Uh, this is now going to have effects on labor because labor is an input to um, uh, uh, economic growth, uh, and it's also going to have effects on the social welfare function because population is an input to the social welfare function. So if there's lower population, then that's going to affect the social welfare function. It's going to lower the social welfare function. So this is a way to account for the deaths that occur due to climate change. If we can accurately try to measure uh, the effect that the uh, climate change is going to have on the crude death rate. So let's talk about how we did that. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, a repeat of sort of what I just said. So um, I, this is a methodology that's somewhat similar uh, to uh, a methodology which is used by Charles Jones uh, in a, 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 a 2016 paper. Um, it's sort of the opportunity cost of life is, is the way to think about this, right? Uh, if there were people that died, they would have lived lives, they would have had utility that they could have enjoyed, but because they died, they no longer are there to enjoy this utility, so that's captured in that social welfare function. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's sort of what I said. Um, uh, so, what's commonly used in the literature, like to the extent that some of the studies in, in DICE as it exists right now, uh, account for health uh, uh, costs, they use a value statistical life methodology. Uh, essentially, it is the willingness to pay to avoid uh, small increases uh, in the chance of death. So, this is uh, um, uh, we can talk more about this later, but I don't use this methodology, and there's reasons why I don't use it. Um, part of it is that it won't account for the, the coupled effects on the economy. Uh, another reason is that it's going to uh, sort of discriminate against people in very poor areas uh, because they're going to have a lower value statistical life because they have lower incomes, so their willingness to pay to avoid death is going to be much lower. Uh, fortunately, with, with my analysis, because there's a single representative agent, uh, Sorry, I'm getting a little technical here, but uh, it, it doesn't have that uh, particular problem. Okay, if you think that's a problem. Uh, okay, so now let's go into some more detail about how I do this. So uh, what I did was, and this is actually, I was using the 2017 UN population prospects, but they just updated it last month, so I updated my model. So all this stuff is update, uh, updated. It's all updated in 2019, so I should say 2019. Um, so the, pop, uh, the UN uh, projects what the population is going to be going forward to 2100. Uh, so they project a crude birth rate, which is this B thing here, uh, a crude death rate, which is the D thing here, uh, and then this will lead to your total population, which is this L uh, over time. So here's what they project. So they project that there's going to be a continued fall in the crude birth rate. This is consistent with the demographic transition. It's been happening for a long period of time. There's going to be a slight increase in the crude death rate. This is primarily from uh, aging populations. Um, uh, and by the end of the century, population, uh, their, their latest projections project that it's almost uh, uh, going to level out. So you can see it's going to be about 10.89 uh, billion people by the end of the century. That's what the UN is currently projecting. So this is sort of like, hey, that's what they're projecting. They don't account for the effects of climate change. Uh, and this should say 2019, actually. Um, sorry, sorry. Are they predicting that the crude death rate is going to rise in the next 100 years? If you go back to this? To yes. Five? Yes. Because there's, the population is significantly aging. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So older people die at higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Don't worry too much about this equation. Uh, <laughs> it takes a, I, I have a whole derivation in the appendix of my paper. So uh, anyway. I talked about those three uh, uh, channels, so the health response, the murder response, the intergroup conflict response. Uh, this is an equation that accounts for that in the level of population. Um, so the key things are these like delta. In economics, uh, we like to use Greek letters. So one of the first things I had to do when I started my economics program was learn the Greek alphabet. <laughs> so, uh, so this is delta, lowercase delta. Um, so there's the health response, which is this delta H, the murder response, which is this delta M, and then the intergroup conflict response, which is delta C. And these are all functions of this T, which is the global average temperature. So it's just like how, how, how high the global average temperature is going to be. Um, okay, so then what I did is I did uh, a review of the literature to look at uh, different studies that projected um, uh, uh, what the crude death rate would be, or the increase in the crude death rate, uh, given different increases in temperature. Um, so I can only use studies that actually project a response on the crude death rate. There's a lot of studies that um, look at effects 
uh, on death in various ways, but you can't really back this out. Uh, I think when I, when I actually submit this, I'm going to expand this a little bit. I don't think it's going to change that much, but it would be good to get more data points in here. Anyway, so I ran just uh, basically a, a regression uh, through it uh, uh, to try to understand what this response function is. So this is regression that tells you for uh, an average temperature increase, what would you expect the increase in the crude death rate to be? Sorry, what are your data points in that chart? So this is, uh, yeah, it, it, there's, a, there's an appendix slide I can show you that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, just literature that projects uh, crude death rate increase uh, for average temperature. So some WHO reports in here. Uh, there's a new paper from a bunch of the authors I already mentioned, like Michael Greenstone, Saul Shane, that projects, I think that's this point here. Um, yeah, there's uh, the Shane and Greenstone 2011 is this point here. I actually remember what the points are, I think. Uh, yeah, the WHO only projected under, uh, this was a 2014 paper. Uh, there's two uh, points here from the WHO. But this is going to be expanded. But yeah, I don't think it's going to change a lot, but I think it would be good to expand it. Um, anyway, so uh, the, um, uh, this is the effects on the crude health rate, just accounting uh, for the, uh, um, uh, the effect of global warming on health. Um, so um, this is uh, uh, the, if you look at 2095, 11.16. This is the crude death rate that the UN is projecting without any effect of climate change. So it goes up slightly to 11.3. So this looks really small, right? It's a little, little increase in the crude death rate, but we'll see the effects that this has in a second. Uh, the second thing is, is the murder channel. So we talked about uh, the, uh, 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 the empirical literature that suggests that there's this relationship between temperatures and murders. So the first thing I had to do was I had to project what the murder rate was going to be to 2100. Um, so what I did was I used uh, global burden of disease data. Um, and you can see that the, the murder rate's actually been falling uh, fairly steadily since the early 1990s. Um, and I just essentially calculated uh, 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 the rate that it's falling, and I projected this going forward. So this red is without the effects of climate change, um, and then there's a slight increase uh, due to climate change, with this, which is this blue here. Um, and again, uh, I was fortunate that uh, these authors conducted this meta-review, so they project that for uh, uh, an inc one standard deviation increase in average temperatures, which is about 0.24 degrees Celsius, uh, there's going to be a 3.9% increase uh, in this intergroup violence, which is uh, primarily murders, and we're talking about mortality. So that's, that's how we uh, project that. So the intergroup conflict channel, this is a tough one. It's a really hard one. Um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, this is, it's hard to see on this screen, but um, uh, this is a, a really cool chart from our world in data um, that looks at the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, crude death rate uh, from these uh, conflicts, intergroup conflicts, over time. So uh, what you should know is that, it's probably hard to see, but this is a log scale, hmm. meaning that um, uh, if this wasn't a log scale, if this was linear, these things would blow up, this would go way up. Um, so what you can see is that during World War II, for instance, which is here, uh, the um, uh, uh, death rate from uh, intergroup conflict was around 200 uh, per 100,000. During the Thirty Years' War, it was around 50 uh, per 100,000. Um, but today, what is it today? It's around two, around two per 100,000. Hmm. So the, the reason for this is that um, the uh, uh, conflicts and the deaths of conflicts are roughly distributed in a power law distribution. So it's really the, uh, the outliers that are driving uh, um, the, the deaths of conflict. Um, so even, this is over the last 27 years, again, this is global burden of disease data, uh, uh, really good data um, uh, that's recent. Uh, who, who can tell me what happened in 1994? What was going on? Rwanda. Rwanda, exactly. So think about wars in Iraq, wars in Afghanistan, insurgencies. You barely see it on here. There's a slight increase. I think this is primarily due to Syria. Uh, but again, the outliers, I think there was something like 7, 800,000 people killed in Rwanda. It's a pretty small country, and you really see this on the statistics. If World War II was on here, it'd be like way up there somewhere, uh, 200 per 100,000. Uh, I think if you look, it's harder to know, but during the, uh, the Mongol invasions, they might have they might have broke the, they might have, they, they're way off the chart. They really killed a lot of people, uh, considering how big the world population was back then. So anyway, uh, th these are all reasons why projecting deaths from intergroup conflict are really hard. 
Um, okay, so uh, thanks to Sean Burke and Miguel, there's a better review of 30 studies that looked at the effect of climate on intergroup conflict across geographies, across time. What they found is that a one standard deviation increase in average temperature increases the frequency of intergroup conflict by 13.6%. So I leveraged this meta analysis that they did very nicely. Uh, and then uh, 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 look at the effects that that has on the mortality rate from intergroup conflict. What should be noted is that it's really hard to know the effect that climate change is going to have on great power conflict. Most of the things that they, most of the studies they were looking at were things like civil wars, uh, uh, and you know when you look at the effects of uh, uh, over the last 27 years, there wasn't a great power conflict. It wasn't a World War II. Uh, it wasn't a World War I or 30 years of war. It was really driving this up. Um, so, again, I'm just sort of projecting on this baseline of relatively low uh, levels of uh, death from intergroup conflict, uh, a pretty substantial increase, but because it's such a low um, uh, uh, you know, baseline to begin with, uh, the effects are, are significant, but they're more modest, and we'll see the overall effects uh, uh, in a little bit here. Um, okay. So, all right, the full mortality response. So this is through all three of the um, channels that we've been discussing, uh, the effect that uh, global warming has on the uh, crude death rate. So 11.16, that's what the UN was projecting, not accounting for climate change. It increases to 11.35. I think, what was it, like 11.31 without hmm. conflict, 11.30. So conflict just nudges it up a little bit, not, not that much further. Okay, so now let's look at the effect that this is going to have on population, on the economic system, on welfare. Um, so let's see. Okay, so this is excess death. So just uh, from that increase in the crude death rate, these are the people that, or this is the number of people that die uh, due to climate change over the course of the 21st century. Um, so I showed this to you at the beginning. Here it is again. Hopefully you understand a little better now how I uh, got to all these numbers. Um, so by the end of the century, 2100, there's going to be a little over 2 million people that are dying uh, due to climate change. Most of this is from this climate health response. So most, most of it is from the effect on health, right? Uh, murders has a small effect. Intergroup conflict has a slightly larger effect, but still pretty small. Um, and again, th these are you know, increases in things like civil wars, which increase significantly, um, but uh, I don't project the effect that it might have on a, on a world war or a nuclear war or something like that. Very hard to do that. Uh, okay, so now let's look at the effect on population. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, the UN is projecting that there's going to be 10.89 uh, billion people by uh, the end of the century. This is going to reduce the population down to uh, about 10.81. So there's a reduction uh, by about 79 uh, million people at the, uh, uh, by 2100 due to climate change. Okay, so it doesn't look like it's huge on this map, but maybe it looks worse when we look at the actual deaths. What are the effects of this uh, on the economic system, right? Because one of the inputs uh, to GDP is uh, labor, right? So you're going to slightly fewer people, you're going to have slightly uh, a, a lower labor force. So the blue is what Nordhaus, sort of the, the, the type of damage that Nordhaus was originally projecting. He's looking at the damage of, uh, of uh, global warming on economic output. So that's in the blue. The red is the uh, additional uh, uh, damage or output lost that's due uh, to uh, the, the slightly lower levels of population. So it's you know it's it's not trivial, but you know it's it, it's not a huge uh, macroeconomic effect. But you know it's it's certainly not trivial. Um, about you know around close to five trillion dollars uh, out of a total of close to close to thirty six trillion dollars in loss. So now, the, this is the effect on, uh, on social welfare. Um, if we recall, there's the social welfare function, which was a way of saying, okay, given that the economy is consuming, that there's, there's a, a average welfare in the economy based on consumption uh, multiplied by the population. I, again, I account for welfare loss uh, using this opportunity cost of life methodology. People that could have been around to enjoy their welfare, but they're not because they died uh, because of an increase uh, in uh, the mortality rate driven by climate. When we account for this, which is uh, most of the purpose of DICE, uh, we triple the social welfare costs of climate change. Uh, so um, that, that's a significant increase from what uh, the current DICE model is 
uh, projecting. Um, okay, so there's a lot of next steps here, a lot of things that, that can be done and should be done. So I, I've been alerting this a lot. Great power conflict. It's, go it's going to be sort of tough. Uh, I feel like this is much more out of sample uh, than um, the uh, uh, sort of effect on civil wars. Um, you think about the types of things that drive great power conflict. It's, that's another um, area that I'm actually really interested in. I actually been doing some research in that area. Um, uh, there's a lot of debate, and I don't think there's a clear consensus. Uh, and I think it's also maybe a bit of more unclear how climate's going to affect that uh, as well. Maybe, maybe it'll increase it, but I'd be going out on much more of a limb if I was actually projecting that thing. Um, also, uh, for those of the more economically inclined, you're wondering why, why is the social welfare cost of carbon uh, and not the social cost of carbon? Uh, because what the original uh, DICE model does is it tells you for every ton of carbon that you're emitting, what are the total social welfare costs of that uh, uh, ton of carbon. So the original DICE model projects that for every ton of carbon that you release in 2015, uh, the, the social cost is about $32. Um, based on what my analysis is doing right now, it's not optimized, so I can't actually calculate this yet. I'm going to be doing that over the next month. So this is a, a bit of a, a sneak peek, but it's it's likely to um, have similar effects as, as the social welfare uh, consequences. What's the difference? Yeah, why why would it not be just exactly the same? Trip? Because there's uh, yeah. So this is sort of I want to go back to uh, my ooh, yes. okay. So um, in a non-optimized version of this model, remember I said there's two things that you need to choose. You need to choose your savings rate, and you need to choose your emissions rate. So I'm using sort of the spreadsheet version of the model where there's an emissions rate uh, that is uh, uh, sort of, uh, you're, it's, it's assuming that there's very little abatement of climate change. It's the business as usual scenario. And then there's a savings rate that's optimized for that scenario, right? What's going to happen is that the, uh, uh, when we optimize this, you're going to choose a savings rate and you're going to choose an emissions rate um, that are going to maximize your social welfare. So without doing that formally, uh, uh, you can't technically calculate the social cost of carbon, but it's probably going to be pretty close to the social welfare cost that I was showing you here. And really, I just got the license uh, for the computer software that does this, actually. It's actually kind of a pain. It's called the GAMS. Uh, so I just got that license a few weeks ago, and I'm excited to do it. Um, yeah. Is the idea that once you factor in that stuff, you would choose a lower emissions rate in the future? Yeah. Because of the feedback of the model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, I just, I don't feel comfortable putting a, a, a social cost of carbon on the screen that doesn't have optimized emission. And optimi though I think it's, I think directionally it's going to be pretty, pretty similar. But we'll find out. But it should be pretty similar. Okay, so the other thing is um, uh, the air pollution co benefit. So, uh, I'm not sure if many of you are aware, but air pollution is actually the leading health risk factor in the world. It's higher than smoking. So on average, this is a, 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 from a paper from a pretty stunning fan, uh, the effects of air pollution on the average life expectancy is uh, 1.8 years lost per person just due to air pollution. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. That's the average for all 7 plus billion people? Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. That's a lot of years. Yeah, so if you live in Delhi, it takes about 10 years off your life, which is the most, yes. Yeah, like it, yeah. <laughs> There's a great Washington Post um, uh, uh, opinion, or it's not an, I don't know if it's the opinion section or some other section, but it builds off this research that uh, Michael Greenstone has been doing with his lab at the University of Chicago. He's actually the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics. Uh, uh, yeah, he's an environmental economist. Uh, but yeah, so he looks around the world. You can type in your uh, exact city, and it'll tell you how much, how many years air pollution is taking off your life. If I recall, I think New York is maybe around one or something like that. We have, we have a great, great. New York uh, is pretty polluted. Though. Uh, not not compared to some of the places where people are living in India and China. Mm. Um, uh, or Th I was in Thailand uh, uh, in January, and it was terrible. Like sort of ruined my vacation. It was so bad. Or LA. Uh, huh? Or LA. Or LA, yeah. Well, anyway, I reckon, here, I, maybe I can show people the, the link to this really cool Washington Post thing that summarizes the research that Greenstone and his team has been doing for, for a while. Um, but anyway, the, how does this relate to my model? Um, if you abate carbon emissions, one of the key things you're going to have to do is stop producing, uh, stop burning so much coal. 
And coal is a huge driver of air pollution, especially in places like India and China. So there's this co-benefit uh, that comes along uh, with abating uh, um, carbon emissions, or with, with, with you know, uh, not, not producing as much carbon. Um, so that should be incorporated, uh, uh, especially if we're thinking about things like uh, mortality. So there's this uh, brand new paper that came out a few weeks ago by Scavroni Cadell. I think it's in Science or Na maybe Nature, um, you know, sort of the top scientific journal, um, that uh, actually does this. So it would be great. I've talked to some of the people that worked on this paper. It would be great to, you know, there's a lot of people that are extending these models in various ways. It would be great to uh, all come together and produce a, a model that's more accurate that accounts for these sorts of things. Um, and the final thing is, which is maybe making this, uh, uh, trying to get a little more at that first thing I told you I was going to do, uh, is think about how can we use this methodology to model other types of global catastrophic risks. Uh, so things like pandemic and nuclear war. So I'll give you a few thoughts on that. So um, uh, for those that are interested in health security, um, uh, there was a really interesting exercise that was carried out uh, in 2018 by the John Hopkins Center for Health Security. Um, and what they it was sort of a tabletop exercise. So I think they, they had a former, uh, uh, Former, I think, uh, Senate Majority Leader um, Tom Daschle was there. He was participating. There was uh, some uh, uh, former people that were at very high levels of government participating in this tabletop exercise. And they said, okay, what would happen if there's an engineered pathogen that was created by a terrorist group that was released? Uh, what sort of effect would this have on the world? How would we be able to respond to it? And they uh, projected that there would be some pretty dire consequences. They projected that uh, from this uh, uh, clade X, um, virus, there would be 150 million global deaths within the year. Uh, and what's really fascinating is that GDP goes down by 50%, or so they are projected. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average goes down by 90%. So there's huge effects, uh, not just on the level of human mortality, but coupled effects on economic systems. Uh, um, so, you know, my, my claim um, is that I think this sort of methodology, this integrated assessment modeling methodology, can be quite useful when we're thinking about uh, systems that have coupled economic, demographic, and environmental effects, such as a pandemic. So what would a, a, a pandemic integrated assessment model look like without any math this time? Um, uh, this is uh, an idea. So there's the demographic piece, which, we, which, which we've been talking about. You could have uh, you know, some of the standard models that are used. Uh, this is a super basic model. You probably use a, it's called the SIR model. Probably use one that's a little more sophisticated. Um, but there's uh, models that project how uh, pandemics or uh, disease, contagious diseases are likely to affect uh, demographics. Um, so the contagious disease is going to affect this. This is then going to affect how the contagious disease uh, replicates. Uh, it's going to have certain characteristics. The basic replication rate, it's called R0, case fatality rate. Right? But then there's going to be these couple effects that we've been talking about, right? So there's uh, uh, demographic effects. If a lot of people are dying, this is going to affect this social welfare function. We're concerned about these people that are dying. They could have lived nice lives, but now they're not alive anymore. So that's going to affect social welfare. It's going to affect the economy uh, because there's going to be a lower labor force uh, because people are dying. Maybe people aren't even going to show up to work, right? Um, so again, there's going to be coupled interactions between demographics and the economy. Uh, there's going to be uh, effects on international trade. If there's a big pandemic like that, uh, you would uh, expect that some countries are going to sh shut down their borders. Um, uh, and then, obviously, international trade is going to affect the economy. And then also, if, there's, if the economy uh, contracts by 50%, this is going to have effects on the climate, too. Uh, I just threw that in there, right? Uh, uh, if the economy contracts by 50%, you can bet that carbon emissions are going to go down significantly. In, in fact, if you look at the last you know, 50 years, the thing that's had the most effect on uh, uh, carbon emissions in terms of bending the trajectory or recession. Um, so this would have significant uh, impact on the climate system as well. So again, like, I think this methodology can be somewhat useful in thinking about these types of big catastrophic risks that have all these coupled effects between these different types of systems. This is just an idea. I didn't model any of this. This, this is an idea, uh, a toy model that you guys can, uh, you can think it's stupid or not stupid and we can talk about it. Um, anyway, uh, so just in conclusion, to wrap everything up, uh, I provided a framework uh, for better using the tool of integrated assessment uh, to deal with phenomena that have large mortality impacts. So there's going to be uh, effects not just on the economy, but also on the demographic system. 
Um, so in 2100, in the 4.1 degree uh, distance as usual warming scenario, um, uh, I project that there's going to be 2.18 million additional yearly deaths uh, and 76 million uh, cumulative deaths over the next 80 years. Uh, and then when we explicitly account for this um, in, in this model, uh, we see that the mortality cost triples the social uh, uh, welfare cost of climate change compared to just accounting for damages to output levels. Uh, which was what the original model does. So thank you very much. We have about, I don't know, 15 minutes or so questions. I would just encourage people, we got, we got a big, nice crowd today, so maybe one question per person, and try to keep your questions short. And then we'll have lots of time for in-person discussion. Oh. Should, should, I pick, should I call people? Yeah. Oh, man, this, this is tough. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just go like in sort of this way. Uh, yes, uh, you're up. Uh, so you... You modeled death rate and you, you found most of the effect was due to health. Mm -hmm. How much did you account for like age distribution in terms of who died? Like, for example, if more older people died, the effect would be smaller than more younger people died. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I guess related to that is did you want to work rate change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all great questions. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the birth rate thing first, maybe with an appendix slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, yes, there's definitely going to be different types of impacts on the birth rate. Um, so one impact uh, was uh, discovered or suggested by a paper by Brega, DeShane, and Gouldy, uh, which came out in 2015. And what they found was that when there were these uh, very hot days um, that we've been talking about that have significant health impacts, there was actually a large decline in birth rates, 8 to 10 months uh, later. Um, so uh, there was a partial rebound, but not a complete rebound in births after that from these hot days. So they projected that climate change is likely to reduce the population significantly just from this effect over uh, the course of the 20th century. I think that, the, again, it's sort of this reduced form of kind of metric analysis, not uh, necessarily um, determining uh, exactly what the channels are. I think their guess was that it affects sperm count, if I recall. Um, correctly, so there's this effect, right? But on the flip side, there's uh, empirical research that has suggested that uh, higher mortality rates tend to have a positive uh, effect on the fertility rate. So this Nobles et al. paper from 2015 looked at the effect of the Indonesian tsunami in 2004, which is a, had a, a very large uh, uh, number of deaths associated with it. It was like, what, 300,000? Um, so a significant number of uh, people died in that very large tsunami, and they found that there were uh, uh, there was a positive effect on the fertility rate after. But I actually just found this really cool paper today that I just threw in here that I want to show you all this related to this question um, uh, that looks at the effect of deaths from conflict uh, on demographics. So this is a really cool paper. Uh, this guy's at the St. Louis Fed. Um, uh, and he looked at the demographic consequences of the First World War. So the First World War, a lot of people died, around 9 million battle deaths, uh, a lot of civilians died as well. France suffered greatly, they had 1.4 million battle deaths, uh, uh, Germany had 2 million battle deaths. But then he said, okay, how much is there this rebound effect, uh, such that, hey, even though all these people are dying, are, uh, are they just going to replace uh, 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 later? And he found that there isn't that much of a rebound. There's a small rebound effect. So this top is Germany. This is the, um, sorry, it's, it's really uh, total live births per uh, 1,000. Um, and so it goes way down because all the, all the men are being, or the men who are of the sort of age where they'd be having children are being forced to be slaughtered on the uh, Western Front, the Eastern Front. Um, uh, uh, so it goes way down, uh, but then it goes back up, but it doesn't, it doesn't go up here. It just goes up here. Um, so what he projected, is that there is 2 million battle deaths, which we, we know about, we can't identify those, but there's 3.2 million birth deficits. So the total demographic effect is 5.2 million. Hmm. So there wasn't a huge rebound in Germany. France had more of a rebound. So this is France. You see, it's like, you'd expect it to sort of be on this trend line, but it actually went a little higher. So they had more of a rebound, but still, they have 1.4 million battle deaths, but they had uh, 1.4 million birth deficits, even with a little bit of a rebound, but not, not enough to counteract all the deaths in battle. So again, yeah, so there's likely to be maybe some rebounds. Uh, how much it is might depend on the channel. Again, the, I, I think something I should emphasize, which I don't think I emphasized enough, um, was that I only try to model things where the empirical literature is like overwhelmingly clear. 
mm-hmm. about the, the effect of, of, the, um, of the phenomenon we're talking about. So because there's uh, sort of both directions for how the birth rate might be affected, uh, and certainly economic output levels uh, uh, can also affect the birth rate, uh, I just left it uh, as is. Um, so, so yeah, so that answers the first question. The second one was about the, uh, just the, the effect on different um, ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that is, I, I used to be on my next step page. I think I took it off for, for this, uh, this uh, talk. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that I could do um, and, and would add richness and depth to the analysis. Uh, right now, the, the, di- the DICE model is done at a very high level. There's a single representative agent uh, when we talk about the social welfare function um, that you just multiply by the population. Uh, when you would add this structure uh, in terms of age, it would complicate the model significantly. I-, I wonder if at that point I could even call this the DICE model anymore, or DICE EMR, an extension of the DICE model. Um, so yeah, that is something I could do in the future, but um, uh, yeah, it's not, not yet. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> All right. So. Presumably, we can debate climate change. We didn't spend resources on things like that. health, safety, survival, migration, etc. Um, shouldn't there be some sort of arrow from economy to population to accommodate that kind of response? But oh, you're, you're like uh, like people moving, like migration and like health and safety and survival in general, like you know, t- uh, like treating the symptoms, so to speak, right? Um, trying to prevent deaths. I mean, because of climate change. Oh, right. Yeah, are you talking about like people trying to adapt? Yes. Yeah, great. That's a great question. Uh, that, that 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 is one of the, the um, key pieces in the literature is is saying that um, people are not just going to hey the world's going to get warmer I'm not going to get any air conditioning I'm just going to die in my apartment and it's really hot right people are going to try to uh, actually adapt uh, uh, to uh, the effects of temperatures so the empirical literature that I'm using. Um, does its best to account for the effects of adaptation. So the, the most important, I think what's been suggested by the literature, the most important uh, adaptation is actually getting air conditioning. Um, so if, if it's 90, 95 degrees Celsius, uh, or sorry, not, that would be too bad. That, that would be crazy. 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, um, uh, you're going to want to get air conditioning. But here's the problem. A lot of the people that are going to die, um, they're not necessarily the people that live in New York or the people that live in uh, uh, most parts of the world. Yeah, exactly. There, there are people that are going to have a hard time uh, affording these types of uh, adaptations. Um, so the empirical literature that I'm using, I, 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 very, I rely very heavily on the empirical literature to account for that stuff. Mm-hmm. And the uh, uh, and I think they, it, it's definitely, I think they do a fairly good job of trying to account for it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of a very active field. Uh, in terms of like people thinking they'll fully account for it, they partially account for it, maybe they're not accounting for it the best way. But uh, the other, the flip side of that though, uh, and yeah, I think maybe this is where you're going, right? Is that uh, adaptation is going to have an effect on demographics because uh, you know the true death rate would be much worse if people weren't adapting. But adaptation is also costly, right? We all need to spend money on really expensive air conditioners, and then we need to pay the electricity costs. Uh, to run these air conditioners all the time, this is going to have uh, uh, effects on, on GDP. So right. you need to think it should be there, that's the yellow to purple. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess you, I, I, this, is, this is just a, a representation. The model works the way the model works, I guess. Right. I, could throw, I could throw the, uh, that uh, in there, but um, yeah, yeah, adaptation is very important to, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems like a lot of this is based on the uh, business as usual model. Yeah. Um, so, how do we trust the accuracy of that model? And also, um, does that account for like improvements in efficiency in technology? Uh, uh, the improvements in efficiency affecting oh affecting the like the the rate of carbon emissions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, there's an assumed that's done within the, the dice model. And I should also be clear. I am taking the dice model completely as given. All the assumptions that he's making, I am just borrowing. And then I'm adding on this demographic. Mm-hmm. And uh, sort of the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm trying to isolate the effect um, that uh, just this effect on the death rate is going to have. So we know that this is why the, uh, uh, the, it's having the effect that it's having. Um, so yeah, so Nordhaus does account for that. Um, so the, uh, he calls it sigma, another Greek letter. And his, mo- his, his model is the uh, sort of 
carbon intensity of the economy. And that is projected to go down, I think, pretty significantly over the course of the 21st century. Uh, yeah, and so what was your first question again? So how do we kind of trust the accuracy of this nice model that's like we're taking for granted? It, uh, in terms of the climate piece or just in general? Um, like how how it's modeled to um, affect like the global temperature. Okay, so the climate piece, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the DICE model is sort of uh, built and calibrated to match uh, the, the standard models uh, of climate change that are uh, used by the IPCC that all project fairly similar things. There's definitely uncertainty, and that's actually something that's kind of funny that's missing from the DICE model. It's called the DICE model. Uh, there's one user manual that has a picture of DICE on the cover, but it's actually a deterministic model. So it doesn't account for random variables for uncertainties. That would actually complicate the model quite a bit. There's other models that actually do that. Uh, but this model is actually quite widely used in policy making. Um, the social cost of carbon that it, it spits out uh, is, has been used in like over a trillion dollars of uh, regulation in the US. Um, uh, so, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's, it's fairly in line with the standard uh, climate model. So you could run the DICE model with a different climate model. Um, uh, and it could have different effects, but yeah, I, I guess the answer is it's in line. Yep. Yeah. Um, given the likely effects that are coming from climate change, as well as um, acute water shortages and acute grain shortages, which are projected, mm -hmm. um, and given the fact that you're using the figure of 4.1 degrees of warming by 4.3, which cited recently by the IPCC, but 4.1, yeah. uh, uh, studies have shown that you get a 10% loss in your grain yield per degree centigrade. There's another study that shows an average of 5.7 degree, 5.7 percent uh, loss in your grain yield uh, based on degrees. You, uh, the IPCC models completely leave out all of the um, feedback effects. So the, the climate models themselves, 20,000 separate climate studies, they show uh, you lose the Amazon rainforest at a, a just around three degrees. That gives you another one to one and a half degrees of warming. At four degrees, you get this rapid loss of the permafrost. You get this immense release of methane from the permafrost as well as from the um, actual methane ice on the sea bottom. The result is, is that you've got, you do not have I mean, uh, you know, the, the, your, the model comes out with a wildly optimistic estimate of the number of deaths from intergroup uh, violence. Uh, uh, let me just, you know, just give you this one example, the one that's most present. The worst civil war in the world is in Syria. Um, it was preceded by six years of unprecedented drought. They lost 60% of their arable land turned into desert. 80% of their farm animals perished, and it's the worst civil war in the world. And the civil wars that are going to be incited by climate change have barely begun. So the model that is being used here just doesn't address any of the, of the issues that are underway. Uh, and this is going to be compounded by the fact that in, in nations where over half of the world's uh, population lives, the, the aquifers are being drained unsustainably. Yeah. So even before the climate right change now, right? affects yeah. the crop yields, the, the loss of the of the of aquifer water is going to affect. Them. So we're going to have a collapse of the global population, and we're going. And so I'm not. It's not this wild estimate of the person online who said 7.6 billion people. No, but it could be anywhere from 100 million to 7.7 billion because we're talking about totally unforeseeable set of variables relating to famine, relating to water supply, relating to civil wars, refugee crises, and interstate wars, and atomic conflicts, like India-Pakistan over the Indus River. So well, well, clearly he's shifting it in the direction of accounting for this stuff. So what is your question for him? So it's like, so how, you know, how are all of these factors, which you, you got on the screen, you know, 4.1 degrees, and that doesn't even account for the, the, the feedback effects. How, how can you come up with this wildly optimistic estimate of 73 3 billion? It doesn't, it's 73 million, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to reality. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, you raised a lot of good points, so I'll try to take them one at a time, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so the first thing, uh, you raise a really good point about agriculture. So actually there was a paper that came out like two years ago by Francis Moore, who's a professor at uh, UC, uh, UC Davis, I think. 17, the one in scientific America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dice Pro, you saw she extended. That's the 5.7% uh, loss per, per degree. Uh, yeah, so she did some, like she did something that's somewhat similar to what I'm doing, which is that she's taking this dice model. It's used widely in, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of regulation. It's uh, you know the, it won the Nobel Prize, if you will. Um, and I'm saying, hey, it's sort of leaving out this really big thing, um, uh, and I'm going to try to account for it. And and that's what uh, uh, Fran did uh, with the dice throw model uh, to account for that. Um, uh, so yeah, I, yeah, I think um, I, I agree with a lot of with most of what you're saying, and I think there's good there's a, a sort of fundamentally different approach uh, that William Nordhaus uh, takes to this uh, versus the approach that maybe even the, uh, the IPC or climate science scientists try to take to this. Um, so when they talk about 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees of warming being some sort of threshold, the, the general idea is that. Yeah, we, we have these, uh, you know, what can the weather tell us about how climate's likely to affect the future? We can estimate a response function. But at the end of the day, we're going very far out of sample. It's very difficult to know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so there's good reason to say that, you know, uh, forget about this optimality thing. Let's just, like, not make sure that we go above a certain threshold. And that's definitely a, uh, a, a way of dealing with this that I'm quite sympathetic to. Um, uh, uh, and, yeah. Um, uh, so, so anyway, uh, what, what's interesting is that you can use these types of models. Instead, this, instead of saying, hey, I want to um, uh, put a, a social cost of car carbon to get uh, you know, some optimal level, um, uh, you can also say, hey, I want to fix the temperature at this level. We can't go above this. What price of carbon do we need to put? And that, that's, that's definitely a... $60 to $180 per barrel, according to the... The IMF estimate of uh, $5.4 trillion a year in the external cost of carbon at the present moment, which, yeah. which by the by, uh, um, the uh, Stern report, the, the author of the Stern report, yeah. Yeah, Stern, says that is why we are optimistic. Yeah, yeah. And that, it, yeah. that, that it's far higher than $5.4 trillion at the present moment. Yeah, yeah. You, you guys should discuss separately after. Yeah, 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 some yeah those, you're raising great points. Actually, uh, I had lunch with Nicholas Stern a few, a few months ago, told him about this project, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, he, he, uh, he, he's, there's a lot of people that are skeptical of integrated assessment models uh, using this optimality condition, but they can be used in other ways, too. Uh, anyway, yeah, so yeah, maybe we can get more questions. Or... Probably a couple more questions. Couple. Uh, uh, yeah, Victor. So you, at the end of the day, are producing a point estimate mm -hmm. right, from a model which has a bunch of inputs with uncertainty and makes a bunch yeah. of modeling assumptions that you're presumably uncertain of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so rather than asking... So the Gelman critique. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so rather than asking you to justify this, yeah. so you've spent a long time playing with this thing now. Yeah. What is your subjective guess for the... Like, what do you think is the probability you're off by an order of magnitude? Right. So, so you, you got a very optimistic number. You said out oh, only like 100 million deaths, only like 6 trillion. Like, I don't know if that's optimistic. I mean, the, the general. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, if you're a super guy, it's going to be roughly, I mean, you're talking about tripling, like, you're talking about roughly tripling the, the cost that. The, the, the social cost of this. So, I mean, so, 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 and, and it's conservative too. And I should also mention, like, this is very conservative. Like, I'm making lots of conservative things and showing that there's still big effects. But yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, right, so I think, I think it's optimistic in the sense that there could be other EA cause areas where, you know, I, I think, like, the stakes are probably a lot higher, right? So, mm -hmm. so this, you know, like, if I believe in the point estimate very literally, Right, I might think, oh, well, I'm not going to like waste my time thinking about climate change too much because this doesn't seem that bad relative to the other things that I do think about. Right, but yeah. if, I, if I thought like, oh, there's a 10% chance that you have underestimated by an order of magnitude. Yeah. Right? Like, with like 10%, this is like way, way. I mean, it's because the losses like really scale on them, you know, like, right? Yeah. So I'm just asking like your subjective belief. So in mean, order of magnitude, oh. more deaths. Just what do you think the probability? Yeah, oh man, I feel very, that's a great question, and I feel very uncomfortable about just throwing a subjective belief without running the analysis. Right. I think it, it is feasible and possible to run this type of, so you're, you probably saw the Gelman-Toll uh, 
back and forth. Uh, Andrew Gelman essentially makes this point that you're talking about, which is a very good point. Uh, in theory, I can run that type of analysis uh, for some of the uh, studies that are in here. For the um, sort of the regression style studies, I can do the type of analysis you're talking about. For the enumerative approaches, which to say, okay, in this situation, under this scenario, this is how many are gonna die in, from these different things. That's what the World Health Organization does. I, I can't take that type of approach uh, for, for that enumerative style data. Um, so, yeah, I wish I could, I, I just, yeah, I, I wish I could give you a guess, but I, I would feel uh, negligent to just throw something out there. If you'll forgive me. Uh, okay, so if, if you want to just, is it closest to 1 in 10,000, 1% or 10%? What? Just a chance. Oh, among those three things, the chance that you, you are an order of magnitude low. Too low. Yeah, yeah, so the mortality response function is an order of magnitude higher than what it is. Yeah, yeah I think uh, especially, I think that the effects on health are fairly, are fairly, have tighter, are going to have tighter air bounds. Uh, I think that the biggest source of uncertainty is the effect that it's going to have on, on uh, great power conflict, mm -hmm. on really big types of conflict. And that's why, in general, I get a little, I guess I disagree with some, some of the assessment style of people in effective altruism that say, because, oh, look, at this is uh, climate change, it's going to be 100 million and forget about it because, you know, we're all going to die from something else. Um, uh, this is definitely going to have effects on, uh, you know, there's going to be migrations. See, there's tons of things I'm not accounting for today. I'm just like trying to add a little bit on the, uh, what, what's already been done. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's very plausible that climate change could have a very big effect on things like nuclear war, great power conflict. I don't know how to estimate that. I don't think anybody does, so I don't right now. Uh, but uh, hopefully that's somewhat satisfactory. I don't, I don't know if I can put a number on it. It was a good dodge. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm going to try to publish this, and I can't just be thrown out. Right. <laughs> You're going to piss people off. So. Excellent, though. <laughs> um, yes. Last uh, one. Last, last question, question, and then we break into the uh, you, you pick it. You pick it. Uh, can I see the hand here? Hang on. Sorry. I, I still want to. Okay. Oh, we got this. Adam? <laughs> Adam. Come on, Daniel. Three million people 
uh, sorry, I need to, ooh, 3 million people uh, that aren't dying directly, but they aren't being born in the first place uh, because uh, um, their parents are dying. So this gets to what John Broom called absences. Uh, yeah, and I actually had a bunch of stuff on absences before. I'm actually tweaking my model a little bit to make sure it's done correctly. Uh, so that's why it's not presented here. But um, that, yes, I completely agree. That's a really important question. Um, so yeah, in my mind, the difference between absences, people that don't have identities yet and will die, I think most people would say we care about those people, uh, and then people that have identities right now that, um, that, that also will die. Uh, yeah, and you can, you can break all those things out. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot.